Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. And I have plenty of wonderful merch in my store, and the link is in my show notes. As well, if you're a fan of Canadian history, make sure you check out all of my shows, from John to Justin, Canadian History X, Canada, A Yearly Journey, and Pucks and Cups, along with Canada's Great War. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. Just click Donate. It helps keep this show going. Okay, on with the show. Eight men and one child sat in a boat, staring at a ship that was slowly disappearing over the horizon. They'd spent the winter on that ship, stuck in the ice. The crew grew angry as they waited to be released from the icy grip of the water. But for the captain, there was only one thing he had in his mind, finding the Northwest Passage. It was all he thought about, and as soon as the ice freed the ship, he was ready to embark on that quest once again. Unfortunately for him, his crew were not about to spend another winter in the ice, as he planned a continued journey west for the passage, a journey that would have absolutely ended in failure, his crew conspired against him. It all led to this moment, as he sat in a boat with his son and seven sick men, watching his ship sail away. The man was Henry Hudson, cast adrift in the bay that bears his name to this day. The crew of that ship, looking back, were the last ones to see Hudson, his son, and those men alive. Or were they? I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X. Henry Hudson was one of the most famous explorers in history. I could create an entire episode about Hudson, and I probably will in 2024. But for now, here's the Coles Notes version of his life. Born in England around 1565, very little about his life is known. He does not enter the historical record until 1607, when he was already an experienced sailor, having been commissioned to lead an expedition to find trade routes across the North Pole. On May 1, 1607, Hudson sailed with a crew of 10 men on the Hopewell, and they reached Greenland on May 13th, following the coast until May 22nd. During his voyage, he saw many whales in the northern waters, and this spurred other nations to send whaling expeditions to the area. In 1608, Hudson once again journeyed to North America, exploring parts of the east coast of Greenland. After those two voyages, he went south for his 1609 voyage, exploring what is now the northeastern United States and parts of the coast of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. On August 4th, he reached Cape Cod, and September 3rd, he found a river he called the North River, but which now carries the name of the Hudson River. Traveling up the river, he reached as far as present-day Albany. On September 23rd, he returned to Europe, but already began to plan out his next voyage, to find the Northwest Passage in 1610. With the backing he needed, he took the discovery on his voyage, reaching what is now called the Hudson Strait on June 25th, 1610, on the northern tip of Labrador. He followed the coast and reached Hudson Bay on August 2nd. Due to the size of the bay, many of the crew believed they had found the Northwest Passage. Exploring the bay, the crew became trapped in the ice in James Bay and spent the winter ashore. In the spring of 1611, the ice cleared and Hudson made plans to continue exploring Hudson Bay with the goal of finding the passage. His crew were very against this. At the time, they had only two weeks of supplies left. For the crew, they wanted to get to Diggs Island where millions of birds were seen and they could restock their food stores. They began to conspire to mutiny against Hudson, leaving him in the bay and returning to England without him. In June of 1611, they made their move. The leaders of that mutiny, according to a journal kept by the ship's navigator, Abacock Prickett, were Henry Green and Robert Jouette. According to the journal, the men who went with Hudson were either sick or loyal to him. Prickett had attempted to convince the other mutineers to not go through with the mutiny, but they did not listen. The mutineers also provided Hudson and the men with clothing, powder and shot, pikes, and iron pot, food, and other items. Prickett wrote, Now were the sick men driven out of their cabins into the shallop. They stood out on the ice, the shallop being fast to the stern of the ship, and so they cut her head fast from the stern, and towards the east they stood in clear sea, and fly as from the enemy. 
Following being cast adrift, Hudson attempted to keep pace with the Discovery by paddling the oars, but eventually the men on the Discovery chose to unfurl the sails and leave Hudson's boat far behind them. Hudson, his son, and the seven men were never seen again. The seven men who were sent off in the Hudson were John King, the mate and previously the quartermaster, Thomas Woodhouse, who was the scholar and mathematician that was recommended by Sir Dudley for the trip. When he was sent out on the ship, he begged for the mutineers to take his keys and belongings to save his life. He was sick at the time when he was cast away. Two other men were Andrew Ludlow and Michael Butt, both seamen, and Adam Moore, another seaman. Butt and Moore were sick at the time they were cast adrift. Another sick seaman was Sirach Fanner. Lastly, there was Philip Staff, a carpenter who chose to go with Hudson. He took several things with him to help build if need be. The first expedition to find Hudson was conducted one year later in 1612 by Thomas Button. Another expedition was conducted by Zachariah Gillam between 1668 and 1670, but nothing was found of the lost men. The Muneers did not have good luck after casting Hudson and the others adrift. At one point, attempting to shoot reindeer, they met a group of Inuit who killed four of the ringleaders in the mutiny. Only eight of the thirteen mutineers made it back to Europe, and all were arrested in England and put on trial, but given no punishment. So what happened? One theory suggests that Hudson was not cast adrift, but was instead murdered. The accounts of Prickett may be biased since he knew they would be tried for mutiny when they returned to Europe, and he would want to put the mutiny in the best light. The fact is that the men were tried for murder, but acquitted of it. But there is still evidence to point towards murder. One such bit is that when the ship docked, bloodstains were found on the ship, and letters that showed the growing rift between the captain and the crew. All of Hudson's possessions were gone as well. Now, if he was marooned by his crew, there is no reason to think that Hudson would not survive initially. He was a tough and determined man, who was an experienced sailor and explorer. At the time of being abandoned, Hudson and his small crew were no further than 75 kilometers from shore, something that could have easily been navigated by Hudson. In addition, they were set adrift on June 23rd, well into summer, increasing chances of their survival. So let's look at the possibility that he did suffer mutiny and had to find a way to survive. In 1631, Captain Thomas James found the remains of a shelter on Danby Island, and since the ship's carpenter was one of the men marooned with Hudson, it's possible that he helped build a shelter to protect the stranded men for the cold winter. According to his report, there were several sticks standing in the ground with chip marks from a steel blade. One Inuit legend talks about a small boat that was found in the water, filled with dead white men, but one living boy who may have been John Hudson. They didn't know what to do with the boy, so according to legend, he was tied outside with the dogs. Cree oral histories speak of a group of white men with bloated faces and limbs who arrived on their shore. They called the leader Firebeard because of his red hair. He apparently married a Cree woman and had children with her. Another legend, one that is much more famous, is the Hudson Stone. According to the legend, the abandoned men were captured by the indigenous and enslaved for a time. They eventually found themselves in the Ottawa River Valley, where they eventually died or were possibly killed. A stone was found in the region in 1959 that had the markings of H.H. Captive 1612. If that is the case, it means that the men were captured and kept by the First Nations for two years at least. But it should be pointed out that the archaeological studies to authenticate the stone are lacking somewhat, so it could very well be a hoax. There are other bits of information that lend more weight to this theory, though. Samuel de Champlain was in the area of the Ottawa River Valley in 1613. While in the area, Champlain found that the Algonquins had enslaved an English child, who they said was the survivor of a wreck in the northern sea. They wanted to make a gift out of him, and this inspired Champlain to journey up the Ottawa River in 1613. Could Hudson or his son have made that journey so far south? Well, he was marooned in 1611 and would have arrived in the area by 1612. Going from Hudson Bay down to the Harakana River to the Ottawa River to the Deep River is possible in that amount of time. But yet, there are still other tales. According to a resident of Fort Francis in the 19th century who had spent winters at James Bay, the indigenous people of the area told of white men who had come to the bay long ago before the big company, the Hudson's Bay Company, ever existed. They apparently lived with the indigenous people and adapted to their culture and even took indigenous wives and left descendants with red hair. Of course, there are rumors that Hudson never made it into the boat in the first place, as I mentioned. So what happened with Hudson? Well, the thing is, 
we will never know for sure. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look on what happened to Henry Hudson. Information comes from Live Science, Beaver Magazine, Ottawa Rewind, Henry Hudson, Aftermath and Notes, Wikipedia, The Adventures of England on Hudson's Bay, Maclean's, Ottawa Journal, and Vancouver Province. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many you can sink your teeth into. We also love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those links in the show notes.